Now, what I'm going to do this morning is introduce you to biblical theology. And I'd better begin with some definition. For many Christians, theology has a bad word. It is a bad word. It has bad overtones. It's academic, it's theoretical, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, that sort of discussion. But theology is merely discourse about God. That's all it is, it's discourse about God. There's obviously some bad discourse about God, incompetent, not based on what God has disclosed of himself, put together poorly. But just about everyone is theological. Certainly anyone who's a Christian is a theologian in some sense. If you talk about God, you're in, engaged in theology, whether you like it or not. The only question is whether it's good theology. But then after you've talked about theology as discourse about God, then there are is a distinction to be made between informal theology, something that all Christians engage in, and formal theology. Theology is a discipline. And then that breaks down into a number of subcategories. And the categories that are used, the labels that are used, are somewhat different in different parts of the world. For example, in the United Kingdom and parts of the world influenced by the United Kingdom, theology is a big category. That includes historical theology, systematic theology, exegetical theology, and a number of others. I'll come to a couple of them in due course. In this country, theology, if you just use the word by itself, and you're talking about the formal branch of study called theology, not just the informal way in which we all do theology, theology tends to mean systematic theology. Now, let's begin with some definitions. Systematic theology, sometimes called in this country dogmatic theology, systematic theology for the Christian is bound up with asking and answering atemporal questions. That is, questions about God, what He has done, and human beings, and salvation, everything that the Bible is interested in, that are structured atemporally. In other words, without reference to time. <clears throat> so, what is God like? Systematic theology will answer with a long description and definition. God is eternal. He is triune. He is omnipotent. Um, he is personal, and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on. What is sin? What did the cross achieve? Who is Jesus Christ? What are human beings? What is our ultimate destiny? Uh, who is the Holy Spirit? And on and on and on and on. Now, that can be very popular level. It can be very sophisticated. But at the risk of oversimplification, systematic theology tends to answer questions about what the Bible says in an ordered, logical, atemporal, systematic way, and hence systematic theology. To call it dogmatic theology is merely a way of saying it's systematic theology that you are supposed to take on board as dogma, that which is to be believed because it is truly taught in Scripture and is confessed by the church. Isn't this an exciting place to speak? Thank you for catching that before there was a disaster. I hadn't even noticed <clears throat> so that's systematic theology, and that's what most people in North America mean when they speak of theology. They mean systematic theology. And that can be pitched at popular levels so that um, if you have an introduction to what the gospel is about, it can be, it can be structured as a subset of your systematic theology, do you, do, you, do you see? What then about biblical theology? Biblical theology is another expression that has different overtones in different circles. For some people, biblical theology is merely another way of talking about systematic theology. It's systematic theology that is based on the Bible, as opposed to based on uh, the Quran or whatever. But for most people today, biblical theology has a different set of overtones. 
two in particular. Biblical theology asks and answers questions that are tied more closely to time. It's not an atemporal discipline. That means that, in particular, it has two distinguishing features from systematic theology. Number one, it is interested in not only what the whole Bible says about God, structured atemporally and systemically, but what each individual book and corpus says about God and sin and the cross and all the rest. So not now simply what does the Bible say about God, but what does the prophet Isaiah say about God? What are the theological themes in 1, 2, and 3 John? What are the emphases in the writings of the Apostle Paul? What does Romans teach us? So it's interested in the individual book and the individual corpus. Book, like Romans, corpus, like the body of Paul's writings. Book, like Matthew, corpus, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so it is more immediately inductive in asking and answering what individual books or corpora teach. But then secondly, because it's interested in God's disclosure over time, it's interested in asking and answering questions about how God has disclosed himself across the centuries. So, now we ask, how do certain themes develop in Scripture? Priesthood, sacrifice, temple, covenant. There are about 20 really big ones and 60, 70, 80 smaller ones that drop in and drop out. And when you do biblical theology, you're interested in tracing out how these themes run through the entire canon. Now, both disciplines have their usefulness. It's not for nothing that historically systematic theology has been called the queen of the sciences. That is science in the old sense of knowledge, scientia. And to get your thinking about God and all that he's disclosed in an ordered, systemic way is the queen of knowledge. Do you, do you see? Historically, that expression has been used in the church for many, many centuries. But biblical theology gets you more inductively into specific texts and actually helps you put your Bible together because... In the purposes and wisdom of God, God did not give us a Bible that is structured as a systematic theology. He gave us a Bible that is made up of 66 books of various lengths, of different literary genres, by different authors, written across a period of about 1,500 years, and in three different languages, and... Um, Books that have to be put together in various ways. We bind them all together and say this is Bible, which simply means book. This is the book. We're a people of the book. We're Bible people. But that means that the Bible has to be read on its own terms before you put it together in conceptually abstract terms. Systematic theology is putting things together conceptually, logically, coherently, systemically. And that's a legitimate question. That's a legitimate discipline. That's a, a, a legitimate effort. But it's not how God gave it to us. God does not start with Genesis 1 and say, chapter 1, God. Chapter 2, Jesus. Chapter 3. And then when you get on, there are more technical things. Chapter 36, epistemology about God. I mean, it, it, it's, 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 not, it's not what he's given us. Do, 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 do you see? There's narrative to understand. And there's lament. There's chronicle. There is spectacular praise. There is introspection. There is letter. There is condemnation. There is oracle. There is apocalyptic. There is proverb. There are macarisms. And on and on and on. All of these different forms. That's the way God has given us the Bible. So the question is, how do these bits of the Bible fit together? And that Bible reader is likely to be most alert most intuitively a good reader 
who begins to understand what each biblical book says and how the books fit together, how themes within the books fit together, so that when you're reading along in Ezekiel chapters 8 to 11, and you find the denunciation of Jerusalem before the fall of the city in 586 B.C., and the condemnation of the temple, and God abandoning the temple, and, and, and threatening, assuring that the temple will be destroyed. You don't think to yourself, well, that's an interesting tidbit. Hmm, God was destroying the temple. But you're asking, how does the theme of the temple play out throughout the whole Bible? Where does it come from? Where's it going? What's the culmination of all of this? And if you begin to track out how those things work, then as you read your Bible and you butt up against any of these large biblical theological trajectories, then immediately your mind runs in both directions and you've put your Bible together. In other words, those trajectories are the sinews that put your Bible together. There are many, many Christians that read their Bibles not understanding how the Bibles actually fit together, but looking merely for the pious thought for a day. A verse a day keeps the devil away, that sort of thing. How does this apply to me today to make me feel better, or to make me a little tougher, to be a little stronger, a little bit of wisdom? And that's the only thing that they get out of the Bible. But they don't understand how the Bible is actually put together. Now, it's not that the Bible doesn't give you food for the day, and spiritual input for the day, and warning for the day, and encouragement. Of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. But the Bible was not written from eternity past. When Moses started writing, or when Paul was writing, he was not thinking, you know, there's going to be some poor little undergraduate in Champaign-Urbana in a couple of thousand years that will need a sort of pious thought for the day. I'll, I'll throw one in. That's not the, what the Bible is actually about. And one of the ways to become a good Bible reader is to be introduced to the discipline of biblical theology. In fact, biblical theology is in some ways an independent discipline, but in some ways it's preparation for doing good systematic theology. The more you know what individual biblical books say, and the more you understand how the themes of the Bible run together, the better you are equipped to, how, to put together the Bible systemically and have an entire frame of reference which shapes your worldview and your value system and your priorities and so on in, in all of life. Instead of taking things on an ad hoc, piecemeal basis, you're, you're, you're using the Bible to shape your entire worldview. Does that make sense? The difference between systematic and biblical theology. Now, if you want to do more in this area, some of you may have already done a lot of reading. Let me give you a few bibliographical suggestions to begin with, and then we'll plunge in a little bit more. Uh, <clears throat> if you've never done any reading in the area, there's a little book, it's out of print, but you can often pick it up on Amazon.com or elsewhere, by Ed Clowney, C-L-O-W-N-E-Y, called The Unfolding Mystery. The Unfolding Mystery, not a bad place to start. There is an Australian author called Graham Goldsworthy. Graham spelt in the British way, G-R-A-E-M-E. -E, Graham Goldsworthy. He's written quite a lot of books on this subject. And three of them have been put together under the title, The Goldsworthy Trilogy. And that's not bad as well. It's easy reading, and he's put a lot of pieces together. Um, there is a fat volume, don't let the title scare you off, um, called The New International Dictionary of Biblical Theology, but it's not what you normally expect a dictionary to look like. It's really broken down into two parts. Um, the, there are four editors, I'm one of them, but the first name to appear on the front cover is T.D. Alexander. Alexander, and then there are three others of us as well. And in this New International Dictionary of Biblical Theology. Um, the two parts are, one part which summarizes the theology of each biblical book, and another part which tends to track out some of the themes, big themes and little themes that run right through the whole Bible. 
So that's a handy resource for those who are teaching the Bible at just about any level, looking things up if you're working through Ezekiel or you're working through John's Gospel and so on. To read the section on that particular book is a huge help in terms of integrating the theological emphases of that book. And there are many, many themes that you can then track out in a page, half a page, two pages, at the most five or six pages, and, uh, and, and help you to put those themes together in your head. One more. Um, there is a series of books called New Studies in Biblical Theology. New Studies in Biblical Theology, NSBT. It's now got about 30 volumes out. Um, I'm the general editor of the series, Truth and Advertising. Um, but some of those books focus on um, one particular biblical book, but quite a lot of them tease out themes. Um, before we get to 10 o'clock, one of the themes I'll tease out for you is the temple theme. And everything I say, you will find in great detail in a book on the temple in that series, uh, written by a chap called Greg Beale, B-E-A-L-E. And, and so if you really become very interested in biblical theology and you want to do a bit more, then go to NSB, search Google NSBT or go to Amazon.com and hit NSBT and you get a whole list of all of the NSBT volumes and so on, and some of them might be of, of help to you. There are many, many more books, but that's the place to start. Now, what I'm going to do with the rest of my time is pick up two or three biblical themes and show you what biblical theology looks like from the inside. And for this, you will need your Bibles open in front of you or you won't be able to follow very well. Either open them up or turn them on, as the case may be. We're going to start with a theme that does not show up very often, but nevertheless has a huge importance. And then we'll, sh we'll turn to a, a second theme, temple theme, which shows up everywhere and yet does some very surprising theme things. We're going to start with Melchizedek. I bet when you got up this morning, you didn't think to yourself, boy, today I'm going to learn something about Melchizedek, but you are. Melchizedek shows up in only three parts of the Bible. If... Um, if things go really quickly, I'd like to throw in sonship as well, but let's start with these two. Melchizedek shows up in only three chapters of the Bible, or three parts of the Bible. Genesis, chapter 14, Psalms, 110, and then several times in the Epistle of the Hebrews. That's it. And yet, once you've got Melchizedek under your belt, uh, you've learned an awful lot of the Bible. So let's begin with Melchizedek in Genesis 14. In fact, there are only three verses where Melchizedek comes into play, Genesis 14, 18 to 20. But now let's put him in context. Genesis 14, Abram is still a nomad. He's been given great promises from God in Genesis 12 and 15, 15 just around the corner. But in, in chapter 14, we're introduced to Kador Laomer. Kador Laomer and three other chaps that are with him have become a band of marauding rifts. They have a number of soldiers with them. They're called kings, but they're kings of cities. And in those days, cities were small towns, big villages. A, a good-sized town was 5,000 people. So... Um, when you speak of kings and their armies, you're not thinking of World War II tank battles on the fields of Europe with 150,000 troops on each side. Or You're not thinking of divisions. You're thinking of skirmishes. And what you have now is four of these village chieftains, kings, with some of their guys from their towns going on raiding parties together under Cater Leomer. And this chap comes from the far north from what is now the area of Syria, north of Damascus. And they go on raiding parties, they attack towns, kill a lot of the men, uh, kidnap the women and children, uh, rape a lot of people, steal the cattle, and, and uh, go, go back home. And gradually, over months and years, their raiding parties are coming farther and farther south, down to the area in what would later be called Israel, now the land of Canaan, where Abram lives as a kind of 
nomad shepherd. And he's allied with some kings, some friends down where he is too. You have to do this for security's sake. There's no national protection. There isn't a nation here that's really controlling things. And at the same time, Abram's nephew, Lot, has taken up residence in the town of Sodom. Sodom is one town nearby as Gomorrah. And Sodom, the king of Sodom, sees that, that these marauders from the north are getting closer and closer. So he allies himself with four others. So that makes a total of five now. Four kings, Kedorlaomer and his gang, and Sodom and his gang eventually get into a, a pitched battle and Kedorlaomer wins. And as a result, Lot is captured and Sodom is impoverished. Uh, captives are taken and Kedorlaomer and his gang are heading back north again with a lot of cattle and prisoners and so on heading off. And we're told, 1413, that a man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram the Hebrew. So when Abram heard about this, verse 14, because he knows that his relative has been taken captive, he calls out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, Dan is a much, more, a much later name that is used to explain what was going on at the time. And Dan's area is way, way to the north, heading up toward Damascus. To say that he had 318 trained men does not mean that they were trained with M16s and uh, RPGs and, and, and so on. It just means that they were fit and could handle themselves well with sticks and staves and maybe there, was a, there were a few swords and there, there might even be, be some bows by this point in history. But slings were more common than bows. And, and, and they could run hour after hour after hour. He brings this bunch together, 318, and he allies himself also with a few others who are who are mentioned a little later. Um, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, who are apparently mayors of their own small towns or large stakeholders with their own troops. So you might have a thousand men going after who knows how many up north. And, and because they're running to catch up with them and don't have a whole lot of animals with them, um, gradually they catch up and they catch up. And we're told that eventually... They, they, they pursue them and catch up to them in Dan, far north. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. See, in those days, it wasn't a, a pitched fight. What tended to happen is they, they clashed, and then whichever side was losing immediately ran. And then the other group pursued them and pursued them. And how far they pursued them was up to them. They keep hacking back any slagger or any, any straggler behind, or somebody was wounded, hack them back and keep on going, and until eventually they just let the rest of them run away. And by this time, then they, they've managed to pick up the, the loot and the, the, the animals and, and the people who have been captives and so on, and they start bringing them together and start the long trek back. And now it's going to take them a lot longer to get back because they have all of these, um, these uh, people and sheep and, and, and so on, and they're, and they're heading back. That's the setup. So he recovers all the goods, verse 16, and he brings back his relative lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. That's the setup, verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Cater Laomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. Now skip 18, 19, 20. 21, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Well, he wasn't being generous. That was the way things worked. From his point of view, it was as if um, Abram had organized a kind of mercenary army. And the payment, if the mercenary army won, was to keep the goods, and then the people were returned to their own, the, the, their own, their own town. So Sodom says, give me my people back, and you, you can have the loot. Abram replies, verse 22, with raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, Creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. All that would do is create more animosities, ground for further festering hatred and animosity and more raiding parties. Besides, Sodom and Gomorrah were 
towns that had a reputation for terrible public, social evil. Abram doesn't want to be rewarded in any sense. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten. That is, they've had to eat on the way up and the way back. And the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. He can't speak for them. Let them have their share. So, so far, the narrative makes perfect sense if you leave out verses 18 to 20. You don't need 18 to 20 there to make sense of the whole passage. In fact, 18 to 20 show up in a really rather awkward place. You're introduced to Sodom, verse 17. Did you notice that? You're introduced to Sodom. He meets up with the king of Sodom. And then what Sodom actually says appears in 21. So the narrative of the exchange between Abram and Sodom is interrupted by verses 18 to 20. What do verses 18 to 20 say? Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be to God Most High who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And then you're back to Sodom and Abram again. Now, let's focus on those three verses and see what the texts say and then ask ourselves, what's this doing here? What, what does it contribute? We're introduced to this chap called Melchizedek. The name means king of righteousness. Melch is the root for king in Hebrew. Tzavak is the root for righteousness. So his name means king of righteousness. But we're told that he's king of a town called Salem. He's king of Salem. Again, small town king, Mary. Salem, S-L-M. The radicals in Hebrew are the same radicals for Shalom, king of peace. But there were a lot of towns called Salem in those days. It was a pretty common name. And there were this Salem and that Salem and something else, including eventually Jeru Salem. In fact, all of this takes place in an area that's very close to Jerusalem. It may well be, you can't quite prove it, that the Salem that, that Melchizedek is ruling over is ancient Jerusalem before it became Jerusalem. It was the town of Salem, Shalom. So he's, his name means king of righteousness. He's king over um, the town of Salem. He brings out bread and wine. Now, you're not supposed to be thinking of Holy Communion at this point. That hadn't been invented yet. This was simply food staples. You know, they've been, they've been running and now bringing back animals and cattle and so on. He, he, he brings out of donkey loads and donkey loads of bread and wine in those days cut three to one to ten to one with water to make it stuff that you could drink at great, in great quantities, um, so, sort of the level of weak American beer, then you can, you can, um, you, you can rehydrate yourself with, with your, and feed yourself with the bread and the wine. He's, he's helping them out. He's helping Abram out. So he's king. He's helping Abram out. And he's priest of God Most High. So he's a king and a priest. Later on in the Bible, you can't be king and priest. If you're a king from David on, then you're from the tribe of Judah, from the house of Jesse, from the line of David. If you're a priest, you're a child of Levi, direct descendant of Aaron, if you're a high priest, and no priest could become king, no king could become priest. In fact, if you tried to mix the two, you got into big trouble with God himself. Ask King Saul, the first king of the United Monarchy. He was king, but then because he wanted to become priest. In fact, he was ultimately destroyed. So the king's line was going to be different from the priest's line. This was before all of that. A long time before all of that. More than 500 years before all of that. And at this point, you have a man who's king and who's priest. He's priest of God Most High. Now, in these three verses, the covenant name of God, Yahweh, in our Bibles printed with a capital L-O-R-D, isn't used. But on the other hand, 
He's God most high, creator of heaven and earth, the text says. He recognizes that God is sovereign, he's the high God, and, and, and that, that he's the creator of all things. So who is he? Well, in the history of the church, there have been many people who've argued that this was a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus. That is, it was a visitation of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who ultimately became a human being through Mary and was named Jesus. It was a pre-incarnate visitation, we're often told, of the eternal Son of God visiting this world before Jesus was actually born 2,000 years earlier. And although there's a long, pious history of that explanation, I really can't find anything in the text that justifies it. Moreover, there is something in a later text that really rules it out completely. Take my word for it, we'll come to the passage in a few moments when we turn to the New Testament. I, as far as I can see, this really can't be the eternal Son of God. This is just another dude. He's another ordinary man. You see, there's no reason for us to think that Abram was the only man in the entire world who was a monotheist, a believer in one God. There's no reason to think that. In fact, when you read the account, it's easy to imagine, it's easy to suppose that Melchizedek and Abram already knew each other. It doesn't sound as if they were complete strangers. Melchizedek comes out to help Abram, and Abram offers him deference. My guess is that Melchizedek was king of this town, Salem, small town there, and he and, Mel and Abram found in themselves kindred spirits, both believing in one sovereign God, creator of heaven and earth, and, and, and formed a linkage of friendship and mutual respect, and, and, and he happened to be both king and priest in this area, and he helps Abram out as he returns, and so on. That's what it sounds like to me. So... He blesses Abram, he praises God, and Abram gives him a tenth of everything as a mark of due deference. So what does this add to the story? Well, because he is squeezed into the account with Sodom, because the account of the interchange between Abram and Sodom is broken up, then part of what Melchizedek does is serve as a kind of foil for Sodom. Abram won't have anything to do with Sodom. There's a wonderful relationship between Melchizedek and Abram. Did you see? Sodom is master of a nasty little town. It's full of public evil. Melchizedek is priest of God Most High, and sovereign of a town called Peace, with his own name meaning King of Righteousness. And, 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 and so in some ways, he serves just as a foil of, of, of Sodom, do, do you see? On the other hand, if you're, if you're a reader of the Old Testament before the New Testament it comes, before Psalms is there, all you've got are the earliest books of the Old Testament, and you're reading this stuff through, you think, good grief. What does Melchizedek contribute to things? And the answer is at this stage, not much. He's a nice foil, but that's about it. And that's all that is said about Melchizedek in Genesis. The only other passage in the Old Testament where Melchizedek is mentioned is Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is probably the most quoted chapter, the most frequently quoted chapter in the New Testament. The superscription says it was written by David. Jesus affirms the same thing at the end of Matthew 22. David says, the Lord, Yahweh, now notice the capital letters, the, the covenant God, Yahweh, says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Who is my Lord? Now, if this had been written by a courtier, that is somebody in the court of the king of David, by this time the Davidic kingship is already established. If this had been written by a courtier, then if the person in the court said, the Lord, Yahweh said to my Lord, you would think that my Lord refers to the king. The Lord said to my Lord, the king. And then what he says fits that. 
Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter, that is the, 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 the mark of your kingship, from Zion, the center of Jerusalem, saying rule in the hands of your enemies, and so on, so on, so on. That all makes sense. But the superscription insists that this was written by David himself. If it's written by David himself, who is my Lord? If David, the king, is writing, the Lord said to my Lord, who's my Lord? If it's not written by a courtier, but written by the king himself, who's my Lord? And the best answer to that is, it's the ultimate Davidic king. The one we call the Messiah. Great David's greater son. And some Jews and many Christians have argued exactly that point across the centuries. That's what Psalm 110 is about. Now, we don't have time to go through this psalm slowly. But if you look at it, sort of in a, an overview, you see that there are two oracles, that is, things that God has said, and then two reflections on the oracles. So the first oracle is what God says, to my Lord, to the ultimate Messiah, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Then a meditation on that. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies, and so on, so on, so on. Then the second oracle is verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Then the oracle, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And there's Melchizedek. And then a reflection. Now that is weird. I mean, that is really weird. Because it looks as if it just sort of pops up in the psalm without any warning. How, how do you make sense of that? What, pulling in something, what's this got to do with anything? Do you see? Moreover, if this is addressed to the one that David calls my Lord, Yahweh says to my Lord, to the Messiah, then what Yahweh, the Lord God, says to my Lord, the Messiah, is oracle number one, you're a king and I'll make you rule. Oracle number two, you're a priest. A king priest? Don't forget by this time, David knows full well you can't be king and priest. His predecessor was King Saul. When King Saul tried to be king and priest, he was killed. But at least the priest that you couldn't be was a priest in the order of Levi. This is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Where does, where does this come from? What's David thinking as he writes this? This is a psalm of David. What is going through David's head? And for years I pondered that without being able to make much sense of it. I thought maybe, you know, God just gave these words to David, just splat, write this down, David, shut up, don't ask too many questions, just write it down. I mean, there's some parts of the Bible that are given like that because God uses different forms of inspiration. I mean, read Daniel, for example. Daniel has some visions. He's told to write them down. He writes them down. He says, God, what's this about? I don't understand. I'm troubled. What does this mean? And God basically says to him, none of your business. Just shut the book. It'll be for a later generation. So God can give stuff like that, you know? And you see the same thing in, in the prophecies of Jeremiah. Jeremiah receives direct words from God. God says such and such, quote, unquote. And so Jeremiah dictates them to his secretary, Baruch, and Baruch writes them down. So some of, some of the Old Testament is given by that kind of verbal dictation. But other parts of the Old Testament are certainly not given that way. When David comes in as a shepherd king, from a long, hard day's work, and he's stretching out and going to bed, you're not supposed to imagine that just as he's ready to fall asleep, God says to him, uh, not yet, David, uh, dictation time. Get out your quill pen. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So he gets out his quill pen. Take the following. All right, I'm ready. The Lord, the Lord is my, is my shepherd, shepherd. I shall lack nothing, I shall lack nothing. Psalm 23. No, 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 no. When David writes Psalm 23, doubtless superintended by God, so that this really truly is the Word of God, he's nevertheless writing out of the matrix of his own experience. He's reflecting, reflecting on all of his experience as a shepherd himself. And he says, not only am I a shepherd, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. And the result is we get one of the most beautiful psalms in all of Scripture. 
In other words, there are different modes of inspiration. God, God gives his word in different ways. And so I asked myself, how does God give Psalm 110? And I thought to myself, since I can't figure out what's going on in David's head, maybe God just dictated it to him, you know? Oracle number two, David, write this down. All right. You are a priest, you are a priest forever, forever. In the order of Melchizedek. What? Okay, in the order of Melchizedek. It's possible. But I suspect now there's a simpler explanation. Put yourself in David's place. You've just become king. Deuteronomy 17, which already existed, prescribes what the king is supposed to do when he becomes king. The first thing he's supposed to do, Deuteronomy 17, 14 and 20, the first thing he's supposed to do is not audit the books of his predecessor, appoint a secretary of state, make sure the army's in a good state. So, no, no. The first thing he's supposed to do is take the words of this law and write them out, make a copy for himself longhand in such excellent printed Hebrew that that becomes his daily reading copy for the rest of his life. In other words, that's what he's supposed to have his devotions from. Now, there are lots of ancient Israelites that were semi-literate or illiterate, but not David. David was a poet. David had a decent education. David could write. So somewhere along the line, in the course of his meditations, he's reading along, and he comes again to Genesis 14. He's doubtless read it before, and he's thought, this stuff is really weird. But when David first became king, he made his capital in the little town of Hebron. He was ruling only over the southern two tribes. But then seven years later, he became king over all of the tribes, and he moved his capital to Jeru, Salem. Now, at that point, if he read Genesis 14, it couldn't help but speak to him a little differently. You know, I'm not the first God-fearing, monotheistic king of Salem. There's this character ahead of me called Melchizedek. And he was king and priest. I'm not allowed to be king and priest. I'm king, but I'm not priest. But according to the Bible, David says to himself, he was king of Salem as I'm king here in Jerusalem. And he was also priest of God Most High. And what David naturally infers from that is that Although at this juncture it is wrong for a person to try to be king and priest, God's forbidden it, certainly not to be a king from the tribe of Judah and a priest from the tribe of Levi. You can't be from both tribes and you're not supposed to mix the jobs. Nevertheless, before the tribe of Levi even existed, before Levi the man even existed, God had already said there was a king priest of Salem. There can't be something intrinsically wrong with being a king priest. It might be forbidden now, but it can't, there can't be something intrinsically. Indeed, maybe the ultimate Messiah, the ultimate anointed one, will be both king and priest. Born along by the Spirit of God, he writes, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, you can imagine that <clears throat> these two passages from the Old Testament, the only two passages that speak of Melchizedek, caused enough kerfuffle in the minds of ordinary Jewish rabbis, thinkers, Bible readers across the centuries that they wanted to know what they meant too. What, 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 what does this look like? So as a result, there has been some Jewish literature that has come down to us from pre-Christian times that, that struggles with, uh, with, with what Melchizedek is doing in the Hebrew Scriptures. For example, at Qumran, the desert communities around the Dead Sea, there was a scroll found in Cave 11 that we now call 11Q, 11, that's for cave, number 11, Q for Qumran, 11Q Melk, 
M-E-L-C-H, for Melchizedek. And it's a whole lot of Jewish speculation about what Melchizedek is doing. It's got nothing much to do with the Old Testament text and absolutely nothing to do with the New Testament text written before New Testament times, but it shows people trying to make sense of those two Old Testament passages. Do you see? You say, Don, we're getting a long way away from biblical theology. No, no, no. We're still on part one of biblical theology. Part one is trying to understand the particular themes that develop in particular books. So we've looked at Genesis, looked at Psalm. Now turn to the New Testament, and then we'll see how this whole thing is put together. Now, Melchizedek appears only in the Epistle of the Hebrews. He shows up several times, just briefly. And then the biggest exposition of him is Hebrews chapter 7. Now, I don't have time to go through this whole chapter, but I want to draw your attention to two or three things. <clears throat> He's been introduced, again, at the end of chapter 6. Now, in chapter 7, the writer of the Hebrews expounds things. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. Okay, that's just summarizing Genesis 14. He met Abram returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. That's just summarizing chapter 14. Not saying anything new. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. That's not saying anything new. And now you start getting the exposition. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Well, that's, that's true. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Well, that's, that's also true. That's just explaining what's on the surface of the text. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Oh, now there's some interesting things here. What does it mean to say without genealogy, and thus without mother or father? See, I don't think that it's really saying the man had no mother or father. If he had no mother or father but just appeared, then he is a kind of pre-incarnate visitation of the eternal Son of God. But it starts off by saying without genealogy. Now, that is striking when you stop to think about it. It's something I left out when we were in Genesis 14. We now need to to consider again. When you read the accounts of Genesis 14, you have to put them within the flavor of the entire book of Genesis. And what you discover in the entire book of Genesis is that virtually anybody who's anybody in the entire book of Genesis is linked to other somebodies through genealogies. The book is full of genealogies. Who begat so-and-so? so that you have not only Genesis 5, so-and-so begat so-and-so, lived so many years, then he died. And then that person lived so many years, he begat so-and-so, then he lived so many more years, then he died. That person begat so-and-so, lived so many years, then he died. And on and on and on. Then chapter 10, the table of nations, all full of links and so on. Almost anybody who's anybody in the book of Genesis is, is connected to other somebodies. Do, do, do you see? Through genealogical tables. And then suddenly, you come across somebody, Melchizedek, who is more important than Abraham because he blesses Abraham and receives deference from him in the tithe. He's more important than Abraham who's given only three short verses and there's no mention of a genealogy. And you think, Whoa, what's going on here? Now, of course, it's an argument from silence. Traditionally, arguments from silence aren't very powerful. But arguments from silence are powerful if you have a high expectation of noise. Does anybody still read the original Arthur Conan Doyle stories of Sherlock Holmes? Probably not. One of the stories of Sherlock Holmes is about the dog that barks in the night. And in this particular account, this dog barks every time there is a stranger who appears. And in the narrative, the night that the murder took place, the dog didn't bark. Therefore, it had to be somebody that the dog knew. Otherwise, the dog would have barked. In other words, the silence of the dog testifies that it has to be somebody the dog knows. Otherwise, the dog would have barked. In other words, the argument from silence works precisely because you expect noise. Likewise, in other arguments from silence, in a book like Genesis, where everybody who's anybody is connected with somebody, suddenly to have somebody who's more important than Abram 
suddenly appear and disappear, then the silence on his genealogy, the silence on his ancestry is itself significant. It's symbol-laden. It's important. And the writer to the Hebrews picks up on it. And he says, look at the account. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life. Well, that's very different, for example, from Genesis 5, where so-and-so is born, he lives so many years, he begets so-and-so, he lives so many more years, then he dies. That person is born, obviously, and, and lives so many years, begets so-and-so, lives so many more years, then he dies. Do you see? Without beginning of days mentioned, without end of days mentioned, without his birth mentioned, without genealogy mentioned, without mummy or daddy mentioned, and without his death mentioned, he just appears, and then he disappears from the narrative. Thus, he is like the Son of God. Now, I said that I would give you reason for thinking that the Bible does not picture Melchizedek as, in truth, the Son of God, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. And here's the proof. Do, do, do you see, the author, if he really believed that Melchizedek was the eternal Son of God in a kind of pre-incarnate visitation, he could have said, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, he is, in fact, the Son of God who appeared before time. That would have settled the issue. That's not what the text says. It says he resembles the Son of God. He is like the Son of God. He is like him insofar as the narrative itself mentions no mummy, no daddy, no origins, just as the eternal Son of God, his origins are in eternity past. Do you, do you see? So in that sense, he resembles the Son of God and he remains a priest forever. So far, the text makes sense. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abram gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now you're talking about how important this man is. The law requires the descendants of Levi one of Abram's great-grandchildren, great, uh, great who became priest to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites. But this man does not trace his descent from Levi. Levi hadn't been born yet. And in fact, he collects a tenth from Abram and blesses him. So he's more important than Levi, he's more important than Abram, because, of course, this is a culture where the older you are, the farther back you go, the more important you are. Listen, even though a lot of you are second-generation Asian-Americans. You have enough Asian background in you to know about respect for ancestors and so on. I was in China not long ago, <clears throat> and I was introduced a few years back. Now, I was introduced as, as someone who had just had his 60th birthday. I thought to myself, no one in America would introduce me that way. In America, they'd always be trying to say, guess that I was maybe not more than 50 or whatever, anything to... I mean, how do you talk to young people if you're over 60? Good grief. But you know what they were saying in China when they introduced me as someone who's just turned 60? They were saying, hey, the guy might finally be worth listening to. At least he's 60. Did you see? And my attitude is, boy, I can hardly wait to go back to China when I'm 80. I mean... This, 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 this is fun, you, you, you know? John Piper and I make jokes with one another about we're living in odd times when a lot of 30-year-olds want to listen to a couple of 60-year-olds. I mean, it's really odd in North American culture. It's not odd in Asian culture. So, likewise, here, the argument is that Abraham is more honorable than Levi because Levi is the great-grandson. And Abraham himself pays honor, deference to Melchizedek. So in principle, therefore, Levi pays deference in Abram to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is more honorable than Abram from whom all the Jews come, from whom all of the Davids come, from whom Levi comes. So you see, there's a certain reverence, a certain deference that pre that's preserved for the, for the old geezer at the top of the peak. That's Melchizedek. And then the real argument begins. All of that is set up all the way down to verse 10. <clears throat> now verse 11. Now you're going to see where the biblical theology kicks in. This argument is extraordinary. And it's powerful once you see it, but it's so condensed it takes a minute or two to unpack it. <clears throat> 
If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, now forget the next bit, which is a kind of parenthesis. It's usually in dashes or parentheses in our Bibles. We'll come back to the next bit in a moment. But to follow the flow of the argument, take it out for the moment so you get the logic. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, that is, if the Levitical priesthood that had been inaugurated with the law of Moses at the time of Moses, if that could have brought about the perfection we need to stand before God, if that could have resolved the entire sin question, if the Levitical priesthood with its sacrificial system and its tabernacle and its temple and its Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement and its Passover and all of that, if that could have brought about the perfection we need, then why was there still need for another priest to come? In other words, if the Levitical priesthood was adequate, then why announce another one? What do you mean? Where does the Old Testament announce another one? Well, it announces it in Psalm 110. That's the point. In other words, get your biblical sequence right. Now you're doing biblical theology. Get your biblical sequence right. Here's Abram Melchizedek back here. Then in due course, you have Moses in the giving of the law here. And then some centuries later, about 1000 BC, you have David here. And in the time of David, God says through David that the Messiah is coming who will be both the king and a priest in the order of Melchizedek, back there. Wait a minute. Before you've got here, you've already had the Levitical priesthood established here. So if you announce another priesthood here, you are already saying in principle that this priesthood back here can't be the final one. It can't be the one that brings in perfection. It can't be the cat's whiskers. It can't be the solution to everything. Otherwise, why would God, God add another one? Do you see? That's the argument that he's setting up here now. And that entire argument depends on reading the Bible sequentially. Abraham and Melchizedek historically back here. Then the giving of the law, including the establishing of the Levitical priesthood, and then later on an announcement of another priesthood. Now follow the argument. You'll see that's exactly what the text is saying. If perfection, verse 11, could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, End of 11. Why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. That's, that is Psalm 110 at the time of Moses, at the time of David. Now go back and stick in the parenthesis. If perfection could have been attained through Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, that's tricky Greek and it's translated a number of ways, but they all mean roughly the same thing. That is, when the law is given at the time of Moses, one of the things that it does is establish the priesthood. Now, when you and I think of the law of God today, what do you think of? If I were doing an association exercise game with you, and I asked you, write down the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the following expressions, what would come to your expression? I might throw out things like uh, temple, covenant, son, anything, and then suddenly say, law of God, what would you put down? I suspect many of you would put down Ten Commandments, right and wrong, morality, things along those lines, wouldn't we? And it's not that the law of God doesn't include things like that, but one of the striking things about the law of God in the Old Testament is how much of it is bound up with what we today call ceremonial law. So you get the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Fine, Exodus 20. Next chapter, ceremonial law. Next chapter, ceremonial law. Next chapter, ceremonial law. What you get is chapter after chapter after chapter of how to build a tabernacle, who the priests are, what an ephod is, and so on. Chapter after chapter. Then you turn to Leviticus. Scads more on the sacrificial systems. Do you, do you see? Oh, there are some moral bits in there, a little bit in chapter 19 about loving your neighbor as yourself and all that. But scads and scads and scads on, 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 on priesthood and sacrifice and what happens if there's mold in the house and what the priest has to do and what happens when there's leprosy, what the priest has to do and, and so on. Then you come to numbers and there's a lot of counting of the people and a few little narratives, but an awful lot more ceremonial law. Then you have to come to Deuteronomy and you repeat the whole thing. In other words, 
You can't think of the law of God as basically Ten Commandments, Charlton Heston, plus a little bit of stuff tacked on about priesthood and sacrifice. What you discover is that the law of God is loaded for bear with priesthood and sacrifice, such that if you change the priest, if suddenly you're no longer talking about a Levitical priest, but another kind of priest, necessarily what you're really saying is the law's got to be changed. That whole law covenant's got to change. So now the argument is, okay, back here is uh, introduction to Melchizedek. Then Levi, the Levitical priesthood, the giving of the law at the time of Moses, then 1000 BC, you announce a new Melchizedekian priest. But if you change the priesthood, you really are changing the entire law. You are announcing the principial obsolescence of the entire law covenant. Whoa, that's big. Because that's saying that the Old Testament itself announces in advance the obsolescence of the law covenant simply by announcing the coming of a messianic king who would be king and Melchizedekian priest. Now, listen again. That's exactly the argument here. If perfection would have been attained, to the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood. Law and priesthood all tangle up together. Why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. That's tied to the parenthetical remarks. Do you see? The parenthetical remarks tie the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, to the giving of the law. You change the priesthood, and boy, the priesthood is not some little adjunct slapped on as a coda that you can rip off. You change the law itself, big time. Indeed, he of whom these things are said, that is the Messiah, he belongs to a different tribe. He doesn't belong to the tribe of Levi. And no one from that tribe, the tribe of Judah from which Jesus sprang, ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. So if he really is a priest, then boy, you really are establishing the obsolescence of the Levitical priesthood and therefore of the law. What we have said is even more clear. If another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, that's how the Levitical priests were established. You had to come from the tribe of Levi. You had to come from the line of Aaron, a regulation established as to their ancestry. But Jesus' priesthood in Psalm 110 is not established on the basis of ancestry. It doesn't say he's got to be descended from Melchizedek. It's just God saying, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. This is what will be. That's what establishes Jesus' priesthood. One who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life, for it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation, that is the Levitical priesthood, is set aside because it was weak and useless, and the better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. That's biblical theology. Now, systematic theology would want to talk about what priests do. What's their role in the Bible? Priests are mediators. Priests are not preachers, first of all. They're mediators. They supervise the relationship between God and human beings. They supervise the sacrificial system. They're, they're, they're mediators. That's why, under the terms of the New Covenant, a pastor, like myself, is not a priest. All Christians are priests in some sense because we all mediate the grace of God to the outside world. But within the church in the New Testament, there's no separate category of priests. The only separate category of priest is priest Jesus. He's the mediator between God and human beings. But under the terms of the Old Covenant, there were priests, a separate category of mediating people. But now the structures of the Old Covenant are gone. We have one priest, King Jesus, and he's not a priest in the order of Levi. 
So in other words, by reading the Old Testament account about Melchizedek sequentially, that's the important thing. You're reading it historically. We've kept saying biblical theology is interested in time. I mean sequentially, historically. What's first? What's second? What's third? By reading the Old Testament account sequentially, then you come to the conclusion that for God to announce the Messiah coming in the order of Melchizedek, after the law on Levi has already been given, then this announcement of the priest coming in the order of Melchizedek is also an announcement of the obsolescence of the Levitical law. That means that whole law covenant can't stand. The Old Testament, which is so full of the law covenant, announces the obsolescence of the law covenant. You don't have to wait till Jesus to get there. A thousand years before Jesus, that's already being announced. That's how you read your Bible. Now, lest you think I'm making all of this up, chapter 8 makes a similar sort of argument. There, it doesn't focus on the priesthood. It focuses on a quotation from Jeremiah 31, who's 6th century. There, in Jeremiah 31, we're told, according to Hebrews chapter 8, that Jeremiah promises the coming of a new covenant. Jeremiah 31, quoted here in Hebrews 8. Look at the conclusion the author draws in chapter 8, verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. As soon as God says, okay, this is my covenant with you, now I'm going to make a new covenant with you. Then it means the old covenant is in some sense obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. In other words, by tracking out how these things work sequentially in Scripture, you begin to put your Bible together. Do you see that? And you discover that you don't have to wait till you get to the New Testament and the arrival of Jesus before you have the right to say, the law is not the final answer. The law covenant and the Levitical priesthood can't finally transform. The animal sacrifices can't finally forgive sin. We've got to have something better than that or we're all damned. So instead of elevating the law and saying, just become more and more obedient to the law and you'll be saved, you begin to see that the Old Testament itself is already announcing a better way, a better king, a better priest, a king priest, the origins of which symbolism go all the way back to Genesis 14. In the mind of God, even though the writer of Genesis 14 didn't know where all of this was going, and the first reader certainly didn't have a clue where it was going, in the mind of God, God knew where it was going, and is dropping down pillars into the soil that will make sense of the entire Bible storyline across time, across time, across time, so that in the fullness of time, Jesus appears as the king priest in the order of Melchizedek who establishes the obsolescence of what came in between. What came in between was important. It pointed forward. It taught us many things, but it was not the final thing. Now, the way you discover all of those things is by the discipline of biblical theology. That is, reading the Bible sequentially. Does that make sense? Now, I promised a question and answer period, and I think it would be worthwhile stopping for a moment now and taking some questions on this one before we do one more quick run-through, and then, then we'll, we'll do a run-through on another theme and, and, and show you how it works out in a couple of other, in a couple of other ways. All right? Question. You're going to have to speak good and loud. I'll repeat it. Just just give it a minute. Okay. 
The question is this. Granted that this is a right argument, and you're talking about the obsolescence of the law, then what do we do with those parts of the law which lay down various moral prescripts and so on? Because, for example, the law says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. If you get rid of the whole thing, maybe then our morality today should be allowed to say you, you can't commit adultery. If you get rid of the whole law, then, then, then you get rid of the whole law. So maybe it's only getting rid of those parts of the law that have to do with priesthood and things like that. And indeed, there are many Christians over time who have argued for what's called the tripartite distinction in the law, moral, civil, ceremonial law, and that this is talking only about ceremonial law. That's a huge discussion. But let, let me give you a couple of hints. When this text speaks of the obsolescence of the law, the law covenant, it doesn't say only the ceremonial parts. It doesn't say that. No, I think that the law covenant as a whole is gone as a law covenant. I'm not under the law, to use Paul's language in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's not under the law, he says. But nevertheless, he is not lawless. He is under law to Christ. That is, the new covenant itself brings with it all kinds of moral prescriptions. I would want to argue, in fact, I have argued many times in print here and there, that the old covenant law points forward in a variety of ways to the new covenant. But it's a variety of ways. The result is that Paul can say, writing to the Romans, one man regards one day above another, let each be fully persuaded in his own mind. He does not say, one man regards adultery as okay, another one thinks it's an abomination, let each be fully persuaded in his own mind. Clearly, there are some lines of continuity. And those parts of moral prescription that change least across time, if you want to define them like that as moral law, I'm happy with the definition. But, but nevertheless, it's the law covenant as a whole, the entire structure of the law covenant that is gone. And a new covenant is put in its place. But that still leaves lots of place to ask questions about, so what then are all the connections between the old covenant and the new? How do they work? And I would argue that they work in terms of fulfillment. The law covenant points forward in all kinds of ways. We're familiar with, with many of those ways. So... There's a Passover structure in the Old Covenant. The Jews are supposed to celebrate the Passover year after year, year after year after year. Now Paul comes along and writes to the Corinthians and he says, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. In other words, Christ is the ultimate Passover sacrifice. When that first Passover sacrifice was, was, was offered up and blood was sprinkled on the two doorposts and over the, on the lintel over the door and so on, the angel of destruction passed over the house and the firstborn was spared. Now Christ has offered his blood for us and death and wrath pass over us because Christ has borne that wrath for us. So how does that relate to this? This one points forward to this. And I would argue similarly, you shall not commit adultery. Points forward to the ultimate purity that Jesus speaks of when he says, you're even supposed to be free from lust. This says you're not supposed to commit murder, but those who hate their brother or sister have already committed murder in their hearts. In, in other words, it points forward to something, and, and the way it points forward varies a bit from law to law and from law to law. Uh, now, there's a, a new Festschrift, uh, a, a book of essays honoring a scholar um, uh, in honor of Greg Beale that's uh, coming out next month. And in it, I have a long essay on that subject if you want to pursue it a little farther. It's a, it's a big topic. It's a, it, you put your finger right on something very important about how you put your whole Bible together. Yes. Okay. The question is, King Saul, the king before David, when he was king and tried to become priest, he was destroyed. So how then did Melchizedek get away with it? That's not quite how you worded it, but that's what, really what you were saying. But the, the point is that by the time King Saul comes along, the covenant people of God, that is the ancient Israelites, are already broken up into their tribes. 
And as they're broken up into their tribes, only the people from the tribe of Levi can serve at the tabernacle, later the temple. And only from the house of Aaron can become high priest. That's already prescribed by law. And Saul is told explicitly that he's not to meddle with that. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. He's not from the tribe of, of, of Levi. So it would be breaking the law that God has given to the Israelites to try to take on both roles. And thus it would be defying God himself. When you go back to Melchizedek, this is before the Israelites really existed. I mean, the, the only Israelites around were Abraham and his immediate family. The, the, the term Israel itself hadn't even been born yet. That was attached to Jacob and, and so on. So, 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 so at this point, there is no covenant community with separate tribal distinctions, no prohibition and so on. And, 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 and so there's no reason on earth why you couldn't be both king and priest. But it's that very fact that I think grabbed David's eye when he's reading his Bible and having his devotions. That is, he sees that he's king in Salem and can't be priest. But already in the Bible, there was a king of another Salem where he was both king and priest. And he can't help but wonder, why couldn't that be again? It can't be an absolute prohibition. It's an absolute prohibition in David's time because you're coming from separate tribes. But why can't you be king and priest? So long as you're not being priest from the tribe of Levi. Supposing you're priest priest in a fashion like Melchizedek. And suddenly you're looking for a redeemer who is not only the king, but the mediator. And that changes your whole vision of who, who the Messiah is, who your, your ultimate savior is. He's both king and priest. This was sufficiently ambiguous in people's minds in the first century before Hebrews was written, that in Qumran that I mentioned earlier, some of the people at Qumran really looked forward to two messiahs, one who would be a king, one who would be a priest. It's the Christians who put together Genesis 14 and Psalm 110 and say, uh, 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 uh. there can be one person being both because this priesthood is not tied to a tribal structure. But that means a new covenant. That means a king priest. And we've got a king priest, namely King Jesus. Did, did you see? That's the way the Bible is actually put together on the point. Yes. I can't hear you. You'll have to speak up a bit more. The question is, it sounds as if I've sort of set up a theorem and then used the Bible to provide the arguments to justify the theorem. The question then becomes, if I use just um, the 66 books of the Bible to prove the theorem, or have I gone outside the Bible? And if so, what is the status of that extra biblical material? Is that the question? Um, well, first of all, I, I, I don't quite accept... Uh, the model that you're using for how I've gone about and done it. It sounds really Euclidean. You have the theorem and then you justify it with, with various arguments. That's what Euclid did with his geometry centuries before Christ. And it's not as if I've started with a theorem and then I've looked through the Bible to find proof text to justify it. Rather, I'm saying that if you read the Bible, then it drives you to this theorem. In other words, the Bible itself teaches it. So that's the first thing I would say. Now, within that framework, I'm certainly using the Bible once I begin to get glimpses of it to see more closely how it all fits together. That's, that, that, that's correct. But I haven't started with an abstract theorem based on pure logic or something like that and then sought the Bible to provide the data to justify the theorem. The second thing I would say is, um, as a Christian, and I'm convinced that it's, that really is the case, God has given us the Bible. He has given us the 66 books. So this becomes the locus of the given data, the, the, the stuff from which I work and move. On the other hand, God has given this to us in history. And insofar as the Bible then um, 
tells all kinds of things of what takes place in history and we have other historical sources, then those sources, even if they're not given to us by the Holy Spirit and they don't have the weight of being the authoritative word of God, insofar as they describe things in history, they may mesh or support or help to explain or serve as foils for us, the kinds of things I find in the Bible. So when I mention, for example, at Qumran, based on documents at Qumran, like 1QH and 1QS and 1QM and, and 11Q Milk and all of these other documents, which I have read, that there is speculation of, about two messiahs coming, one priestly, one, one, one kingship. Um, this doesn't prove my theory. On the other hand, it does point out that people recognize there were two tracks in Scripture, at least that we're looking forward to an anointed person, a king-anointed person, and a priest-anointed person. And it was the Christians who put these things together and said, no, 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 no. If you read the Bible properly, then Genesis 14 is related to Psalm 110, and we will ultimately have a Messiah, a single Messiah, who is king and priest. Now, it's not that Genesis, that, that, it's not that the Qumran scrolls prove the point, but nevertheless, precisely because the Bible does take place in real space-time history, it's not too surprising if there's some overlap with historical documents that can help to clarify some things that the Bible itself establishes. Does that help? I saw another hand over here. And this time, I think a microphone will miraculously appear in front of your nose. This will be the last question so that we can um, head to the next um, topic. We might have time for one or two questions at the end. Go ahead. like figure and that's why he's so mysterious and he he shows up randomly in different places and Abraham honors him and gives basically tithes and offerings. Um, but this whole idea that he does have a mother and father and he is flesh, uh, you know, real life, flesh and bone sort of person. Um, and you talk about he, how he's basically older than Abraham and such. Is he basically then sort of like an old righteous king priest whom God has somewhat chosen then to represent? Okay. To Sounds to me as if you got it right. Uh, okay. I, <laughs> in, in, in other words, in, in other words, once you no longer start looking to prove that this is a pre-incarnate visitation of the eternal Son of God, which I think is ruled out by Hebrews 7, because the text says not that he is the Son of God, but that he resembles the Son of God, mm -hmm. okay. then the only thing that makes sense of it is that he was an old, righteous, monotheist. He believed in, he didn't know the covenant God, he didn't know the name Lord, Yahweh. But, but nevertheless, he was... What, why should we think that, that Abram was the only monotheist in all, in all of God's great earth? He, he was a righteous, God-fearing, God-believing man who served as king and priest of the little town of Salem. And God so ordained the inclusion of this story without mention of his mummy or daddy, without showing any genealogical connections, but inserting him into the account as... He appears, breaking up the Sodom account. See, precisely so it grabs your eyeball. You say, what do you do with this? What's he doing there? He's a foil, but what do you do with this? And then that becomes grist for the mill for David's spirit-prompted reflections. A, a millennium later, Abraham to David is roughly a millennium from 2000 to 1000 BC. Um, David reigns from 110 to... Um, to 970 BC, um, then, 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 then suddenly um, uh, you, you realize that, that the only explanation is that God himself is putting together the pieces to establish a trajectory. But now the trajectory is such that the second point in the trajectory, Psalm 110, is after the law is already given. And that suddenly changes the dynamics of discussion. Do you, do, do you see? Now, if you're reading the Bible atemporally, you don't see that. If you're reading the Bible temporally, you do see it. And the argument is that Hebrews 7 is specifically reading the Bible temporally. Now, that sort of thing happens pretty often in the New Testament. Let me mention one other, one other place that you'll see that this is really important. In, 
in Galatians 3. It's not about Melchizedek. It's not about priesthood. But there the argument is, the promise is given to Abraham that in him and in his seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Then after that, the law is given. But the argument is, the law cannot annul the promise, the promise given to Abraham. It can't do that. So you mustn't think that the law covenant with its sacrificial system and circumcision and all the rest comes along and somehow annuls the promise given to Abraham that in him and in his seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It can't do that. The promise is the promise. It stands. So then, why is the law given, the writer says. And he works out why the law is given until in the fullness of time <clears throat> the promise given to Abraham is actually fulfilled. Now, if you asked a first century conservative Jew living in Palestine, how do you please God? The answer would be by observing the law. All right? How did the prophet Isaiah please God? By observing the law. How did King Hezekiah please God? By observing the law. How did David please God? By observing the law. How did Moses please God? By observing the law. How did Abraham please God? By observing the law. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Abraham is before the law. How can you say that that's the most essential thing for Abraham? And the conservative first century Palestinian Jew would reply, yeah, but Moses, but, but the book of Genesis says that Abraham kept all my statutes. What are those statutes? It must be the law, because we, we know that's how you please God. So he must have had a, 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 an early pre-revelation of the law. The law must have been given to him privately, do you see? Because we know that's how you please God, by observing the law. Oh, all right. How did Enoch please God? By observing the law. Enoch, seventh from Adam? Give me a break. Yeah, but it says he walked with God and he was taken. And later on, the expression walk with God is used of those who, who, who walk in accordance with the law. So he must have had a, an early pre-revelation of the law so that, that that's how he pleased God. He knew about the law of God. Now, do you see what you're doing when you answer the Bible this way? What you're doing is elevating the law to a position of interpretative control over the entire storyline. You're no longer reading the sequence of the storyline. What you're doing is elevating the law to the place where it's become the controlling, interpretative grid over the entire account. Now, almost certainly, Saul, who becomes Paul, the Apostle Paul, believed along those lines before he was converted. But once he's converted, one of the things that changes in the way he reads the Bible, a lot of the ways he reads the Bible are just very Jewish. But this is different. Now he's reading the Bible sequentially. And he sees that the promise is given before the law is given. The addition of the law can't change the promise. The promise still must be fulfilled. That means the law cannot be elevated to the place of interpretive control that a lot of conservative Jews thought it had. Do you see? And that opens up the door to a lot of things. It means that the law can't be the final expression. It can't be the ultimate expression. And so when Messiah comes, you're going to get more than mere reestablishment of law and sacrificing a whole lot of sheep on the Temple Mount again. It's, it's, it's got to be different from that. The ultimate thing is the promise of the Messiah, the promise of the seed, who comes and through whom all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Do, do, do you see? And so you start seeing how in passage after passage in the New Testament, the way the New Testament Christians read the Old Testament in a way that is utterly justified by the text itself. It makes sense. It's fair to the text is that the text must be read sequentially. That is, according to biblical theology. You can't flatten it all out, or you begin to get a distorted reading of the Word of God. Does that help at all? There are a lot of passages in the New Testament that depend on reading the Old Testament sequentially to make sense of the Old Testament. Once you see that, you're already on your way to doing biblical theology. Okay, give me just a few more minutes and we're done. This one's going to be much faster. This one, we could easily spend four or five hours on, just on this, this one. I mean, it's a bare introduction. And that, because, because in this case, there's so many, many uh, passages that we could refer to. This time, I'm going to whiz through so that you, you get an overview. And that's Tabernacle Temple. Now, if by temple you mean a great big 
stone and masonry construction. You're just thinking of building. That's all it is. But you're not thinking of it in any sense in terms of what it represents, what it accomplishes or functions as. Then um, your, your vision of the argument will be too small. The point is the temple was the place where people met God, where the holy God chose to meet sinners. Now, if you look for temple themes bound up with where does the holy God meet sinners? Where does the holy God, even before their sin, meet people? Then you realize that in some sense, Eden itself is a kind of pre-temple temple. God meets with his image bearers in the cool of the day. They have conversation together. And there's intimacy and spiritual joy and pleasure. You, you see, it's as early as that. Then with the introduction of sin, you've got a sacrificial system and so on. You have Abraham offering sacrifices, for example, Isaac offering sacrifices, Jacob offering sacrifices, even when there's no building. But eventually, I will skip over an earlier temporary structure. Eventually, God establishes the tabernacle. That's with the coming of the law of Moses. And in the tabernacle, I'm sure you all know, it's, it's a place that's built on a three-to-one ratio, three long, one wide. And inside, two-thirds of it, two-thirds of it are the holy place where certain things take place. And the last third, then, is built like a perfect cube. It's as long and wide as it is tall. It's built like a perfect cube. And only... The high priest can go into that room. It's called the most holy place or the holy of holies. And only then, once a year, and on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, sprinkle the blood of bull and goats to pay for his own sins, the sins of his family and the sins of the people, once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And that's established as an ongoing thing in Israel. You're familiar with all of that. Now, one could introduce a lot more details, for example, when, when the, the Ark of the Covenant is stolen by the Philistines, for example, in the period of the Judges. One, one could talk about uh, what, what happens when people disrespect the, uh, the, the, the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. One could talk about all We'll skip all of that. And eventually come to the time when Solomon builds the temple. Now, even before you get to Solomon building the temple, two of the most important chapters in the Old Testament for understanding biblical theology are 2 Samuel 6 and 2 Samuel 7. In 2 Samuel 6, David has now become king of all of the tribes, and he moves his capital city to Jerusalem. And for the first time, the tabernacle is moved to Jerusalem. And in the next chapter, that's chapter 6, chapter 7, then David's genealogy, David's lineage, David's, David's line, David's kingship, is established. It's going to be an eternal kingship. So now you have Jerusalem, the tabernacle with its priestly system, and the Davidic line all established together in the, in the course of three chapters, 2 Samuel 6 and 7. Very important for establishing the whole flow of thought in the Old Testament, you, you see? And then eventually David wants to build, in chapter 7, a te temple for himself, but God says, no, it's not going to happen that way. Solomon's going to do it. And Solomon builds the temple. And when Solomon builds the temple, at his great prayer of dedication, the glory falls upon the temple as the glory had fallen upon the tabernacle. The priests are, are scared. They're, 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 they're driven outside by the glory as God manifests himself in some spectacular display of glory and presence. And, and Solomon's great prayer of dedication is, is really wonderful because he realizes the temple properly understood, does not localize God. Behold, he says, even the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house which I have built. Nevertheless, you've chosen to put your name here. You've chosen to disclose yourself here. And if your people who have your name sin, if they turn again to this place and repent, would you not hear from heaven, not hear from this temple, hear from heaven and forgive? So this becomes the place where God meets with his sinful people, according to the prescription of the law, according to the sacrificial system that God has ordained. That's in the 10th century. Solomon reigns from about 970 to 930. But eventually, the kingdom is divided in two. Ten tribes go to the north and establish their own false temples, two of them. 
One in Samaria, another one up in Dan. But still, the remnant of God's people still come to Jerusalem. Eventually, the ten tribes in the north are taken off into captivity under the Assyrians in 722, 721 B.C. Another 140 years later, Jerusalem is destroyed. And with it, the temple. 586 B.C. And God's covenant people can hardly believe this could happen. How could God let the temple be destroyed? How, 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 could, how could that be? Why doesn't God preserve his name? Why, why doesn't he, he act miraculously? And the prophet Jeremiah and the prophet Ezekiel both say, listen, you just don't understand how rotten your sin is. God's bringing judgment upon you. If Nebuchadnezzar wins and destroys Jerusalem, it's not because God isn't strong enough. It's because you are so wicked. This is what you deserve and this is what you get. And the southern tribes go off into captivity. 586 B.C., the temple is down. The interesting thing in all of that is some of Ezekiel's preaching to the exiles along the banks of the Kebar River. In Ezekiel chapter 11, for example, he preaches to the elders and he says, don't you understand? God says he will make his sanctuary with you. Do you hear that? His sanctuary is not the building of masonry. That's going to be destroyed. His sanctuary, his presence is actually with the people of God who are exiles in Babylon. If the crucial thing about the temple is God presencing himself with his people, you don't need masonry. God presenced himself with his people back in Eden without masonry. The crucial thing about the temple is that God meets with his people. That, that, that's what's supposed to be going on. You can take away the temple and God can still meet with his people. You still got temple, temple effects, you see? So God meets with his people e even when they're in, in exile, in, in, in Babylon of all places. But eventually the people do return. Another a, a, a temple is built, a second temple, and hence the preaching of Haggai and one or two others. And under Nehemiah, the, the walls of the city are rebuilt and so on, so on, so on. And then you come to the New Testament and Jesus says, according to John chapter 2, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. What? Without hydraulics? How do you destroy a temple of stone in the ancient world? Good grief, you need an army to do it. And then raise it again in three days? Nowadays, you know, habitat for humanity. Put in a foundation and a whole lot of prefab and a couple of decent engineers and a crew of 50, and you can put up a small house in a day. Yeah, you can do it. But then it's all prefab, a lot of power tools, a lot of hydraulics, even when you're putting up gyp rock nowadays, you know? You put up a sheet of gyp rock and you have a, a power tool with a string of screws and a plastic container. I can put up gyp rock pretty fast, and I'm no professional. But in the ancient world, no power tools, no hydraulics, and everything's made of stone. And the law says you're not allowed to use a hammer and chisel anywhere within the temple precincts. So everything has to be measured and cut elsewhere and brought in manually to build a temple. And Jesus says, I will build it again in three days. Huh? As a result, the Jews didn't have a clue what Jesus was talking about. The disciples didn't have a clue what Jesus is talking about. Read John 2 and you'll see it. It wasn't until after Jesus was raised from the dead that they remembered Jesus' words and believed the scriptures. And they understood that the ultimate temple was Jesus himself. That is the ultimate meeting place between God and sinners is Jesus himself. Looked at one way, Jesus is the priest. Looked at another way, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Looked at another way, Jesus is the ultimate temple. He's the ultimate meeting place between God and human beings. Do, do, do you see? Read John 2, 19 to 22. And they believed and they knew that he was talking about the temple that his own destroyed body constituted as it rose from the dead. He is not only our priest and our sacrifice, he's our temple. So the trajectory from the Old Testament temple Come, brings you finally to Jesus. And then derivatively, the church is sometimes seen as the temple. That is, it's the meeting place between God and a lost sinful world. Now, it's 
that, that's why I'm nervous. You see, when I see church buildings that are called Temple Baptist Church or something, as if the building is 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 is, is a temple. No, 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 no. This this is this is a great building, but it's it's not a temple. It's not it's not in itself the meeting place between God and human beings. No, the real meeting place between God and human beings is not a hunk of masonry. It's either Jesus Himself in the New Testament, or it's the Church of the Living God. That's where sinners meet with God. And in one remarkable passage, only once, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Christian's body is a kind of temple. That is, it's a place where God meets others through the individual Christian. And therefore, we're not supposed to dishonor the temple of God. And then you press on and press on and press on in the Bible until you come to the new Jerusalem, the last vision of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22. Oh, it's full of symbolism. The ultimate state is pictured as a new heaven and the new earth, and then it's pictured as a city. But what a strange city it is. It's built like a perfect cube. Now listen, guys. If you're not married yet, on your wedding day, do not turn to your wife and say, you remind me of a city. It will not go down very well. But nevertheless, the symbolism of the Scripture is that the city is the bride of the Lamb. Talk about mixed metaphors. Lambs have brides? I mean, you normally think of lambs just sort of going out in the field and doing it. I mean, they don't have marriages, do you know? But nevertheless, one of the things that apocalyptic literature does is mix the metaphor. And you're supposed to understand the contribution of each of those bits and pieces. The city, the city, Jerusalem, the ultimate abode of God, you know, is, 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 is the bride. Okay, okay, that's picking up another theme that runs right through Scripture. Of the Lamb, the Lamb who is Jesus. So the sharpest intimacy between the church, the people of God, and Christ himself on the last day, but this Christ himself on the last day is also the sacrificial lamb. All of these metaphors are coming together to give us image after image after image to think better about who Jesus is and what he's done. And then in the midst of it all, the city is called a cube. Now, I fly into Chicago many, many times a year. Chicago is a great city. If the air is clear and you're sitting on the proper side of the airplane, you can look out the window and see all the skyscrapers and so on. But however many skyscrapers there are, it doesn't look like a cube. Why is the New Jerusalem described as a cube? There's only one cube in the Old Testament. Just one. I've already mentioned it. It's the most holy place. The place where in the past, under the Mosaic Covenant, only the high priest could enter with the blood of, lamb, of bull and goat once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. But now the whole city is a cube. It's a way of saying the whole city is the most holy place, and all of God's people are in it, which means we don't need a priestly system. We don't need the blood of bull and goat. We're already in the presence of God. That's the point. Do you see? And then in case we haven't got it, that final vision goes on to say, John the seer says, I saw no temple in that city. Well, how could there be a temple in the city? The city itself is already the most holy place of the temple. Did, did you see? You don't need a mediating structure where God meets with his people. You're now in the presence of the living God. I saw no temple in that city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And you realize that the consummating vision of the Bible is pulling together all these strands from the Old Testament into their consummated glory in a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem built like a cube, the very presence of the living God. Now the point is, if you begin to understand how this trajectory of temple language works right through the whole Bible, then every time you read any passage in the Bible in your devotions that butts up against that trajectory, you remember the whole trajectory. 
and where it's going. And you start crying, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. And you understand that the temple is not first and foremost about ritual, although there's lots of ritual under the Old Covenant. It's about where human beings meet God. The church is the temple. Jesus is the supreme temple. And in consummated glory, we'll all be in the most holy place in the presence of God forever because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the Bible's storyline, rightly configured, the storyline that tracks right through Holy Scripture, brings you to glory. Do you see? And you can do that with theme after theme after theme to begin to understand how the trajectories of Scripture bring you to Jesus and to glory. Let us pray. Open our eyes, Lord God, that we may read your most holy word as it was meant to be read with its different forms and literatures, different writers across time, establishing these patterns, these trajectories, until finally we come again and again and again to the feet of Jesus, in whose name we pray.